Hi there, my name is Ron Rogers, and this presentation is titled Bringing American Technology to Our Foreign Friends. Now, I had a request from my electrical engineering friends that I've kind of neglected here, I know that, I'm sorry, uh, uh, to talk a little bit more about some topics like this. So I'd like to talk about uh, when I was lead engineer in the microwave technology group. Now, I, you know, I was a, a pilot for United Airlines, I was furloughed, and so, you know, I had to keep food coming into the table, so um, I had electrical engineering background and uh, well I initially worked for flight test at Cessna and Boeing but I wanted to work as electrical engineer since I'd spent so much time uh, studying it and I I figured I'd never had an, another chance and here's my little Boeing pin Boeing military aircraft company uh, this was down in I was in industrial IPB3 industrial building something this is back when Boeing actually had Boeing military aircraft company in Wichita before they sold it to Spirit so they could um, pretend they weren't responsible for problems uh, did I say that out loud anyway um, this this was a, this was a very fun project and uh, that is a, uh, a little sensor that went into the nose of a drone Drone. It was a low frequency type of device. Lincoln Labs actually developed the antenna setup and it was supposed to be used uh, to get kind of a directional steer uh, to an emitter. Um, and uh, because it's low frequency, you know, low frequency antennas are large. They're a function of the wavelength. And so they, uh, as you can see from this design, and you notice those little, um, I think those are SMC connectors there. You get a little scale. It's a little bit over a foot. But they put a capacitive hat on the end of it there uh, to increase the electrical length. And, uh, you know, when I was lead engineer in the microwave technology group, I ac actually had a physicist working for me who I would say, you know, can we do this? Well, this was a bunch of PhDs at Lincoln Lab, and they put this thing together and basically told us, can you make this work? Because uh, they basically did. And so we joked about that, that it takes a bunch of uh, BS, Bachelor of Science, not what you typically think BS means, um, engineers to, uh, to uh, solve the problems of the PhDs. So we got this thing. And uh, like I said, it was supposed to go into the nose of a drone. Now, this is back in the 80s. So this is, this is a long time ago. Technology was a lot different back then. In fact, uh, we, were, we were pushing the boundaries of technology quite a bit. And it was actually very enjoyable. I, I would get uh, programs and I'd say to my boss, we don't have the technology for this. And he says, develop it. So that was kind of interesting. And there's some interesting stories along uh, that that are declassified enough. I can uh, talk to them and I probably will in future ones. But anyway, uh, this was supposed to go into the nose of a drone. Now, I looked to see if I could find a picture of this. It was actually in Aviation Week um, published because the, the program was canceled. Um, uh, it, we were just one of the seeker heads, so it wasn't our fault. Uh, but it was canceled, and it looks sort of like this. It was launched uh, from a little vehicle, and it had propellers in the back and uh, stuff like that. But uh, like I said, it, it didn't come to fruition. But, but the point of this thing uh, was... We were supposed to find these low frequency, and I know there's some high frequency stuff there. Uh, we were supposed to find these low frequency transmitter stations uh, that were um, operated by our foreign friends, if you want to put it that way. Uh, maybe people who weren't our friends as such. Um, and the device was, uh, the purpose of the sensor was to bring this um, drone with a uh, explosive warhead to this uh, vehicle and detonate it. Now, I should have been a little sensitive to this. You see, my dad was a forward air controller in World War II. That's him on the right there, and they, they've got this little radio, and of course they didn't have the technology back then to have uh, these little drones out there hunting them, but, uh, you know, I should have been a little sensitive to that. But here is the uh, the drone uh, sensor again. It's small, and, and the fun thing was, um, okay, we're trying to make this we're trying to make this work. We're trying to take this guy out. Okay, I was a ham radio operator. A lot of the people in uh, the electromagnetics uh, section were actually hams, which is kind of interesting. I guess uh, that's uh, you know. Uh, the type of thing you um, uh, kind of uh, go to, uh, you know, if you like ham, you probably like being an electrical engineer, and uh, we had a lot of them in the system. Now, the, the guy there, you see, I don't have a good picture of Ed. Ed. Ed was an interesting guy, and see, I had come out of the Air Force, and I 
learned a lot of actually good management skills. And I really enjoyed being an engineer. And I enjoyed being a pilot, but I could have easily, if I couldn't have been a pilot, um, done this sort of work because I found this immensely interesting. In fact, on my last day leaving, I was 30 minutes leaving because um, I was talking to the various people um, in a project on my um, antenna, that uh, strategic radar thing I talked about, how I accidentally doubled the accuracy. I was talking to them for a good 30 minutes. The other people were leaving and saying goodbye to me. My boss was waiting because he didn't want to leave before I did, but um, uh, I still had some, uh, you know, stuff to talk to him. And I, and I had a guy set up to take over for me and they called back Monday and they said, oh, he went to be an airline pilot. And they go, yeah, sure. Because they know I tended to joke a little bit. And they said, no, he really, really did. But anyway, I'm working with that. And with the management skills I got out of, uh, you know, the Air Force dealing with people, Ed, Ed was an interesting guy to work with. He was very smart. He didn't suffer fools gladly. And uh, he and I got along really well. And he wasn't in the main building with the other electrical engineers. He was up at the antenna um, lab up here um, where we did a lot of the an antenna testing. And he had his own little desk up there kind of by himself. He had some... Uh, um, um, uh, fuzzbuster radar detectors that he hold, held the patent on. So he had a good little source of uh, extra income. He had his own uh, microwave lab at home, which is kind of interesting because even, uh, you know, back then, uh, the, instrument, the instruments were pretty expensive. It's not like now where everything's digital and uh, computer programming and you can, you can get it quite cheaply. But anyway, um, Ed was interesting to work with. He didn't suffer fools gladly. And uh, I had a high-power microwave um, problem I was working and he gave me the book and I mentioned this in the in the other uh, presentation but he gave me the book and I brought it back and said there was an error in the calculations and he looked at me and goes really and so I showed him my lab book because you work a problem forward and backwards and I said yeah it needs this term in the high power microwave handling uh, and he looks at me and says yeah they corrected that in addition to and so that was his little test of whether I was an engineer I guess worthy of him and I guess a lot of guys didn't pass that test, and uh, they, uh, Ed didn't suffer fools gladly, but I worked with Ed. I had a lot of fun, um, and my boss said I need to work with him on this project, so I said, okay. And my boss said, well, a lot of people have trouble working with Ed, and I go, well, I've been working with Ed for a while on, on various uh, projects. I went to him as a source of knowledge, and he goes, oh. So anyway, th this was a fun project because I would come up with an idea. Um, I would kind of go home and you know how you dream about stuff and you come back next day and I said, I got a good idea. So I would, I would come back with an idea and then would play with that. Then Ed would go home and Ed would come back with a better idea. So we'd play with that. Then I'd go home and I'd come back with a better idea. And then Ed would go home and come back with a better idea. And this, this went on for quite some time. And we actually had, a, we actually had a lot of fun with it and, uh, developed a pretty, uh, pretty close relationship. So I think we had a, a you know, we, we developed a antenna that actually would work pretty well. And this is the antenna range at Boeing in Wichita. And all of this, I don't know if it had to do with selling everything to Spirit or what, but um, except for the building that the, the building structure is there, everything else is gone. The towers that we mounted stuff on. Everything is gone. I, I uh, saw some pictures of it, and it it's really kind of sad because there were a lot of good people working there. Um, we did a lot of good work, and this is all gone. Of course, the um, the systems now you you don't really need this low frequency sensor as well because uh, it was very difficult to implement. And as you as you know, if you got any background in this, you know that it's it's really hard to get a good fix on these lower frequencies because you have reflections and it's it's hard enough to make the sensor really accurate i mean i felt we could have got the thing fairly close but you know we're still working with antenna patterns so you know you really don't know but it was an interesting project of course now you would just have somebody you know um you would send a, a reconnaissance drone over. You would see uh, that you had the target you wanted to take out. You would get coordinates on it. You would put it in GPS, which didn't exist back then uh, when we were doing this, at least not operationally. But you would put it in the uh, GPS coordinates, and you'd tell the thing, hey, go take this out. So um, the problem is solved in a different manner than the method we had to solve it, which is kind of the, the thing about how engineering works. You know, you sometimes the way you're going after a problem um, you have a lot of problems with it, but 
um, that technology just doesn't work out and you have a better way of doing it and then you implement that technology. Okay, so for my electrical engineering friends, that's the story. And like I said, um, you know, a lot of people ended up I, this was a temporary situation for me. A lot of people ended up being uh, engineers who may have wanted to be pilots and stuff, because I hear from you on that, and uh, they couldn't do it. And other people just do engineering because it's fun. I mean, that's what I went to school for. And this was, this was very, very interesting. And this was just one of a multitude of projects I worked on that um, were just, it, it made you want to come to work every day because it was just so much fun. And frankly, I miss it. Uh, you know, I play with ham radio, but it, it, that's not the same. We don't have as nice a toys as, as we could get when I was doing military projects, as you can probably imagine. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it.